unfortunately, Melissa couldn't be here, but we're still going to try and focus a little bit on the topic that she was going to talk on, which is great people. Like, how do we get them? How do we find them? How do we keep them? Um, so, let's kick it off with Janine. What are your thoughts oh on... Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on great people in your organisation? How do you keep... I mean, you talked about how to keep them. How do you find them? Yes, well, I think um, I, the, the topic that I talked about this morning and some of those... Um, strategies really are the same strategies that we use to attract people in our organisation. So I talked about, um, well, well I suppose from the administration and before I mention that is um, we're in, we work in a pretty good place. So our head office is on the beach, um, so that always helps, right near an airport between Brisbane and Byron Bay. And it's the organisation, you know, is a nice size organisation now, $70 million a year. We've got a, a, you know, a decent, um, I guess a decent infrastructure where people who are travelling could actually still have the lifestyle of being able to work in Byron and, and work for a not-for-profit organisation and have, you know, some pretty seriously ser um, senior roles um, in all aspects of our organisation. So I suppose the location has helped us a little bit. Um, but then for us, particularly in the industry, is to have a profile in the industry and I mentioned about our ambassadorship and our leadership in conferences and people knowing about our innovation and making sure that you know that innovation has led to a lot of you know a lot of technical um, technology that we use that gets a high profile so in the industry it's quite good um, because we um, you know we'll advertise we had a big service rolling out we'd have like a thousand applicants so we can see that we're starting to build we've got that reputation so people hear about us we also go through social media people follow us on it you know, for an aged care organisation, we've, we're not great. We don't have a huge social media following, but probably the biggest in the industry. And so okay. people are connecting that way. And we, on, on some roles, we just make sure that we hit social media so that people know the roles are available. Um, so a different size organisation, um, yours, Jeff, how do you think about sort of getting great people in the door? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, been interesting. Most of my staff have approached me directly. Um, I love LinkedIn, I'm pretty active on that, so be careful if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, but they've just been attracted to the purpose and the vision um, before they're attracted uh, you know, to me as an individual, I suppose. It's about, you know, they can see what I want to achieve and they want to be part of that, which is great. Quite a few coming from corporate. Our last employee hire was a general manager from KPMG, um, young woman, uh, under 30, I think. Um, but you know, shared the vision and the passion and while you're part of that sort of culture. Um, obviously the technical skill set was tick the box there. She was a high performer, eight out of 10. We don't hire anyone less than that. And um, uh, yeah, understood the culture that we have. Um, and part of that culture is why people, you know, the culture is part of the reason why they come and, and work with us. Like, you know, we celebrate everyone's birthdays. We have amazing workspaces that we work out of. You know, we've got a five star, five green star eco office. We have our own cafe, barista, food, the whole box and die. So we've invested heavily in that. Um, so people love that, like they would living by the beach at Byron. I definitely want an office there. <laughs> um, and yeah, just help uh, allow them to co-design the workplace as well. Like, you know, what do they want it to look like? Um, how do they want people to act within the workspace? Um, they have a say in the other employees that come to work there. It's, it's not a um, dictatorship. It's, we have a flat structure, um, albeit we have a CEO. Um, everything is flat. Everyone has their specialised areas and work together and, and get along really well and have a say in who's joined the team. Fantastic. Um, I thought it might be interesting, uh, could we grab the catch box just behind you there on the left? Could you pass it over to Erin? Because I wanted to ask Erin a little bit about sort of attracting people because you were sort of in that pilot, like how do you attract someone to something where you're like, well, this might not exist past X date? Um, I love recruitment. It's one of my favorite things ever. So I'm a recruitment nerd. Um, and that started back when I was working in journalism. So I used to do a lot of recruitment for journalists. Um, we used ethical jobs. So we did a job ad on that website. And it was really <coughs> interesting. Um, they said that our story was very typical of what they hear a lot, which is that we tend to get fewer applicants through ethical jobs, but they're usually of higher quality. Um, we had two roles that we advertised for. One for the workshop manager, so that's a qualified electrician. Didn't get as many applications for that role. Most of the people who applied for that role weren't interested in social enterprise. They were just qualified electricians. 
Um, and so they found it you know, through Google or something like that. But we also had the one day we banned driver roll, and we got heaps of applications for that. We actually had to close it early. Hardly any of them had van driving experience other than you know personal like moving house stuff, but they were so interested in the mission. So that's a really interesting way to find people if you don't need something that's heavily skill-based. Um, but also, if you do place an ad either on ethical jobs or any one of the other job sites, then you can promote it through social media. So I posted it on LinkedIn, we put it on our Facebook group, we put it on Instagram. Um, when we did a board, uh, when, whenever I recruited for board members, I did that through, I think it was, is it our community? Yeah, or it, um, they've got a separate wing just for board stuff, and so that's how we recruited for our board members. When I posted an ad for a financial person, I then posted that in a women's networking group on Facebook, and that's how I found Stacey. So once you've got that main job listing, you can then work further to promote it and make sure that more people see it, and you can get your friends to do that or your board members, or anyone who's keen and interested in what you're doing. Cool. Uh, Steve, have you, have you recently recruited someone that's new, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Could you uh, share a little bit about, about that? Yeah, so we uh, recently uh, recruited, uh, we recruited three roles. Um, we ended up with uh, two. Um, but it was a pretty interesting process. We, we found someone who was, on paper, um, the perfect fit for one of the roles. Uh, we brought her into the interview, which is an hour late, the interview, but we still went and met her, and we still thought she was great, and we, we thought, yeah, that's the person for us, we're, we're going to get her in, we're going to get her in just to do a bit of a values alignment meeting, and we, we got from there, and it was at that point that she said, I'm just not in the headspace to, to take on a role, so, you know, that was a really great lesson for us, we probably should have known that, in the fact that she's now late for both of those meetings, but we just, we couldn't get past the person on paper um, for a long time. We thought, no, this this is the person. We're sure we can we can just get her to come to things on time. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be interested um, from it, whether it's from either of our people sitting next to me or other speakers or even attendees, um, how people get beyond the resume. I mean, you know, how do you think about uh, resumes are great, but um, as we've seen, even in high level positions, people just chuck anything on there sometimes, but they shouldn't. <laughs> um, we did a trick in our job ad. So we said, you know, send us your CV and cover letter. Tell us what your favorite appliance is and why. So that, that was a trick. There was no right answer to that question. The only right answer is that you answer the question. And a lot of people didn't. And so if you, I actually had a spreadsheet of all the applicants, and I, I copied and pasted their responses so you could see them side by side. And the people who didn't answer it, it wasn't necessarily a deal breaker, but then when the application started to flood in, we had more choice and we were able to go, well, if you, you know, you weren't the top person we're looking at and you didn't answer the question, you're out. So it's just a matter of seeing, you know, can they actually follow the process, are they saying that you do they actually care? Yeah, we don't consider CVs too strongly. Um, we like to see them face to face. We normally set them a task, depending on the position. Um, which will be submit to us a one or a two pager about what you can bring to us, what you expect from us, a little bit of knowledge about the sector. Um, if it's a, a sales type role, we'll, we'll ask them what the next month looks like for them in a sales role. Um, we scour their LinkedIn and, and have a look at who we're connected to, make a few calls. We just hired an EA who started on Monday. Um, she used to be an AA for, for a contact of mine, so I just pick up the phone and have a pretty frank chat with him um, to yeah, validate what I thought. Thinking about sort of a larger organisation, is it really process driven your recruitment, or do you think it, it, apart from like, I mean, there's all the cultural stuff, but let's talk about like the. Oh, um, I think ours is, our, ours is process driven. Like, yep. we do have a, oh, for most roles, we do have a, a, a process that we use, but. Um, I haven't got, you know, there's, there's some, we have some challenges in recruitment. Um, not so much the people, not so much the applications coming in. And in fact, the people who we recruit are, um, you know, are, or we interview are fantastic. But in our industry, very traditionally, um, particularly in community care, so where we've got care workers in the field and nurses and, and allied health, health staff, they're, they're used to coming into an office, grabbing their roster, talking to other staff, heading out in the field, doing their paperwork, coming back. We don't have offices. 
that, like everything they do is through technology and so this is very difficult because we're a bit of ahead of the game in that way. They come in and they just go, oh my goodness, I've got three screens, four screens, two screens, I've got you know, these mobile offices, I've got to go onto portals and, and it's, that, that's the trick for us, the hard part for us is to, is to look at that technology capability knowing we just actually have to spend more money on, recruit, on, on orientation because we have to give them that skill because we, we just lose good staff because they go out in the field and also um, they're, they're virtual workers, they're teleworkers, they're used to working in an office and it doesn't matter what we say to them in an interview, you know, we say, do you know, you, won't, you, know, you only see us virtually, you know, your office is the M1, your office is your car, you know, and they go, oh, yeah, that sounds fantastic, you know, I've got kids, it'll be great to be, and I think that it can be hard for some personalities to, I couldn't do it, you know, I, I find it very hard to, to work by myself and we're asking half of our workforce or more um, to work virtually and so we have had to come up with many strategies over the years to absolutely make them feel connected and, commun you know, and, and they can communicate with us. It's been a very big journey for us and still a journey because everyone hasn't caught up with us. I have two things, Jeff. I was wondering on that same thread, uh, what do you think about virtual teams um, and even virtual co-founders. But secondly, I wanted to switch gears into that sort of co-founder one. What do you think about um, finding that co-founder if you are a single founder? Uh, yeah, so we've been focusing on that recently. Um, we actually have um, seen so many people coming through that do have similar ideas that are single founders and they just, they can't match up. And earlier this week, we actually had a, a social drinks event in Melbourne. We had about 100 people there and we had six people pitch for anything but money. And they were able to pitch to find people that would be co-founders with them or that would believe in their idea. So I think um, creating the environment that allows you to do that is great, but uh, we've actually just invested in a mentoring platform of which we're going to spin out a founder matching platform that enables people with passions and organisations to match up founders with co-founders. Um, so it's a, it's a great space. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I think if you create the environment for people to come together, they'll sort of naturally find each other. And I uh, founded Sustainability Drinks in Melbourne uh, eight years ago. And um, that was a way to bring like-minded people together in a social sense. And that was amazing. We ran about 150 events over the years, uh, hold the world's record for world's largest green drinks. Um, and there was people that came out of that that started businesses together. Um, dated, married, um, ended up going to new employers, left corporate jobs and went and worked in not-for-profits. Um, so yeah, it's all about the environment and the ecosystem that you create that can help make that happen. Cool. Um, so I'd love to see if there's any questions out there. So it really gets around the idea of um, skilled volunteering and uh, corporate volunteering. And I guess my um, generic observation is that a lot of uh, not-for-profit organisations tap into corporate volunteering for unskilled things like maybe painting a local um, homework facility or something like that rather than really tapping into the true value that's available in the corporate sector in that sort of setting. Um, what sort of areas do you think are really, I guess, available and useful out there for not-for-profits to tap into? and what sort of steps um, should they be taking in order to access those skills and, and actually use that potentially as a pathway to build strong partnerships? Um, yeah, it's great. I mean, there's quite a few platforms for connecting volunteers, um, particularly in the environmental space, but also I think our community and a couple other not-for-profit platforms have volunteering connecting mechanisms. Um, but you've just got to ask. Um, get connections and networks and go and ask for what you need. Um, there's so many people willing to give time and expertise back. Um, and again, like Felicity said about partnerships, sometimes a partnership might be for that skill set. Um, some corporates have special days, like Deloitte have Deloitte Day, where every single Deloitte employee uh, can go out and volunteer. Um, th there may or may not be someone here from Deloitte, that's okay, but what happens for the rest of the year? You know, you should be out there donating time all the time. Um, so yeah, I think just connecting up with, with the platforms that help. I guess my two mentors are volunteers 
the corporate volunteers and um, they, I guess, again, probably being nearby, there's a wonderful community of um, business people and people who have done very well in both social enterprises and, and you know, very large multinational organisations. And um, because of our not-for-profit status and, and um, because of what we do, they volunteer their time and it's really fantastic for me. So they, and they're very busy people, but they'll just, you know, we'll meet every two months and they say, what's your agenda? And I go in and they say, you've got two hours, you know, with us and they'll sit down and these people get paid a lot of money and, but they just say, what are we, what are we talking about? And I might say, oh, joint venture in New Zealand. What about due diligence? And I'll go bang, 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 bang. And they'll, and I'll say, uh, foundation or something about this. And I'll go, I know somebody, you know, that you should need to talk to before I get back to my office. The email introductions have happened to all the people that they've talked about because they're well networked. Um, so it's just, it's been very powerful for me or very beneficial for me and I think our organisation and um, to have those um, corporate volunteers. I think it's not all just about them doing non-professional work. I think there's people more than willing to help you with your cause. Just on that really quickly, um, I had a conversation, actually two conversations about a year and a half ago with uh, the engagement manager, like corporate CSR, I can't remember the exact title, from Telstra and also one from ComBank. Both of them said to me, one of our biggest problems is we have all these people who come to us who um, work in senior roles inside our organisations, they want to do things, we can't find enough for them to do. Um, so I think that's the big thing for not-for-profits is just to ask and ask more and keep on asking for those things because there's people there, it's a bit like the money, like you've just got to ask it the right way too. Um, how do we improve not-for-profit kind of opportunities in terms of, so, so probably the, all, the, all, all the best graduates will be going into like the high paying fields like banking, becoming lawyers, not going to not profit, not profit because there's a lack of opportunities. How do we, how do we change that? So and I'll use our recent employee from Sydney. Um, went really well at uni, went, walked straight into a KPMG um, internship or graduate program, stayed there within six years, became general manager of an area, um, was getting paid, you know, well, um, and then discovered her purpose and can't get out of there quick enough. Um, so I think it's a shame for the people that do graduate and go to corporates and chase the big dollars and then realise, oh, actually, I should go and work in a not-for-profit where it's much more enjoyable. Sure, the money's more modest, but, you know, money's not everything and if you live a simple um, fulfilling life you don't need massive amounts of money and I know that sounds a little contradictory to me managing a lot of money but <laughs> I, I don't pay myself a salary and um, I live very modestly and um, yeah I'm super happy about it so yeah I think it's a shame that people do chase the big dollars um, I suppose it's about communicating the type of environment that you offer and the different type of work that you offer to attract those graduates into not-for-profits. Um, and I suppose th they'll just have to have a realisation themselves um, about that. You can't really force them to realise that it's, it's better over here than, than over there, potentially. Fantastic. Um, thanks, guys.